evangelist is Dr. David Bauer in his teaching on inductive Bible study. This is session number eight, book survey, Jude. I mentioned before uh, uh, we broke uh, the segment into this new segment, uh, we want to use the, the letter of Jude as a as a sample of book survey. Um, in a sense, this is also will also be a, a kind of it can serve as a sample of segment survey too. Uh, but uh, um, it is, uh, of course, more of more man- manageable length. Uh, for one thing, so and of course, rather obviously, we, since we have only one chapter here, rather than uh, chapter titles, we will give titles to the paragraphs that we have. Now, I've been working on my just mentioned here uh, with the Revised Standard Version, um, which uh, I consider to be a a, a very worthy uh, translation for for study uh, purposes. Um, it is uh, it is perhaps one of the close. It is perhaps the closest thing to a standard translation in English, although the RSV has, does not sell nearly as many copies, of course, as for example the NIV. It does stand in a direct line uh, in translation from the King James version, the Authorized Version of 1611, through the American Revised Version of 1901, and then of course you have the Revised Standard Version that came out in the New Testament in 1948, and in the Old Testament in 1952. And then after that, of course, the, you have the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, um, that came out later. The ESV, the um, uh, English Standard Version, is essentially uh, the RSV, uh, as they, they say explicitly in the introduction to the ESV, is essentially the RSV with only a few changes here and there that reflect the theological um, commitments or convictions of the editors of the ESV. Um, but uh, one thing that uh, um, I like with regard to the RSV is that it, is that it actually... Uh, um, takes a mediating position between two extremes, if we may put it so, of translation theory. On the one hand, and translation involves really a kind of continuum, on the one end of a translation theory, uh, we have uh, what is uh, sometimes referred to as formal equivalence, or I should say yeah, some, uh, formal or verbal uh, equivalence or the like, uh, which uh, really uh, has to do with... Uh, uh, with a word-for-word word sort of translation, where the, the uh, translators attempt to find just exactly the right Greek or Hebrew word for this uh, English word for the corresponding Greek or Hebrew word or the like. This is sometimes pejoratively referred to as wooden translation or maybe literal uh, translation. Uh, the uh, best example of this is perhaps the New American Standard Bible, the most extreme example of it is the Amplified Bible, where they're not satisfied simply to identify one word that represents a Greek or Hebrew word, but, but often will uh, have, a whole per, uh, have a parenthesis in which there are several words there that are meant together to capture the precise thought of the Greek or Hebrew word that is used. The other, on the other end of this continuum, we have what is sometimes what is called dynamic equivalence. Uh, and the view here is that translation does not involve identifying the best Greek or English word for uh, that corresponds to the uh, the best English word that corresponds to the Greek or, or Hebrew word, but actually translating whole units of thought. So, getting a sense of, of of the meaning or the thought of a whole sentence or even a whole paragraph, and then translating the sense of that sentence or that paragraph into English. Uh, this is represented by. Uh, by every translation that comes out of the American Bible uh, Society or the United Bible Societies, for that matter, uh, and the, the uh, an extreme extreme example would be paraphrase. A paraphrase uh, is an extreme example of dynamic equivalence. 
Now, the value of the RSV, I think, is that it, is that it, it seeks to uh, chart a v, uh, mediating position between these two. In other words, it is not committed either to uh, verbal equivalence or to dynamic equivalence, but makes translation decisions with regard to whether to move in this direction or that on the basis of the translation demands of individual passages. Uh, so it's more eclectic, and we might say more, di more inductive uh, in terms of its application of translation uh, theory. Uh, the NIV uh, tends, to, uh, tends to, in some places, tends to be more, uh, tends to move in this direction, and in other places tends to move in this direction, uh, in some measure on the basis of uh, who was responsible for the translation of various portions uh, of uh, the uh, Bible. Uh, but uh, I myself, at least, do not see the kind of careful thinking with regard to uh, where to move towards the dynamic equivalence or to verbal equivalence in the NIV that I find uh, in the RSV. Now, the RSV is more difficult to get a hold of now, particularly since you have the production of the NRSV. Uh, but uh, uh, if, if you find it difficult to get a hold of the uh, RSV, uh, you might try the ESV. As I say, for the most part, it is essentially the RSV. The NRSV is a, is a generally good translation, uh, but I don't, I'm not using it because I actually have found that the NRSV has introduced at least as many problems as it attempted to solve uh, in, uh, in translation. So there are places where it actually improves upon the RSV, but uh, I found many more cases where it actually uh, introduces, uh, and sometimes inexplicably introduces uh, translation uh, problems. So for that reason, uh, I still prefer to use uh, the RSV. But one of the things with regard to the RSV is that, you know, it is not, it is, it is, it is not gender inclusive when it comes to human beings. And so it still talks about man or mankind or this kind of thing. And of course, I'm sensitive to how women may feel, may feel excluded uh, by that kind of language. So you have to, no translation is perfect. And uh, I, uh, I live with that because of the value, other, otherwise a value that I find in the RSV. But at any rate, uh, the paragraphing in the RSV is uh, indicated by ind indentation. So where you have indentation, you have a new paragraph, and that's the basis then for these paragraphs, these paragraph titles. Now, being an epistle, uh, the letter of Jude is, of course, uh, ideological general material. The primary concern is the presentation of ideas you do have certain people mentioned uh, here, uh, of course, including Enoch, for example. Uh, but uh, the, the, the book is not about them. Uh, the book is really about ideas. And these persons are mentioned, places are mentioned, um, events are, men men are mentioned in the service of what is really the primary concern of the content of the book, which is a presentation of ideas. Now, in terms of main units and subunits, uh, again, we want to stand back and, and make these, it's important to make these units and subunits as broad as the material allows. In book survey, you want to avoid getting bogged down in details uh, because the more you focus upon details, the, the less able you are to focus upon the broader overarching movement of the book. So you want to uh, you don't want to focus upon details, but to stand back and get a sense of the broad, overarching movement of the book. And, um, and that really translates into making your units and subunits as broad as the material allows. Uh, in my judgment, uh, we begin with a salutation here uh, in verses 1 and 2. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And then, of course, the body of the uh, letter uh, begins in verse 3. And uh, we seem to have uh, the epistolary conclusion uh, in verses 24 and 25. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So clearly that is the conclusion then. So we have the introduction and the conclusion, and then verses 3 through 23 would be the body of the letter. Now, I myself see a, as I stand back and get a sense of the broad overarching movement, I myself see the major break here coming between verses 4 and 5. In verses 3 and 4, we actually have what we might refer to as a kind of announcement of this letter. Beloved, being very eager to write to you of our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For admission has been secretly gained by some who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly persons who pervert the grace of our Lord, of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. You see what this does is it points to the occasion and the, and the general statement of the letter what occasioned the letter, but also the message of the letter is is presented here in a general way. So you have uh, here, uh, in terms of the breakdown of verses 3 and 4, these would be the subunits within verses 3 and 4, the original intention, which was to write of our common salvation. And then the present concern, which is, the appeal to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, and the reason for that appeal, verse 4, for, notice here you have that explicit substantiation, for admission has been secretly gained by some who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly persons who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you come to, the, to verses 5 through 23, I've, uh, I've given this a label, the address. The description, especially the description of the troublers, and the appeal as to what to do in the presence of these troublers, with an emphasis in that appeal upon the role of mercy. Now, you'll notice that in the general statement, in verses, uh, three, in verses 3 and 4, he begins by, in verse 3b, by saying that, that, that he writes them to appeal to them to contend for the faith. Appeal to them to contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And then he goes to the reason for this appeal, because of the admission of the ungodly. Now, notice that when it comes to the address, he reverses the order. He begins with a description of the ungodly, with the admission of the ungodly, in verses 5 through 16, and then in, at the end of the body, in verses 17 through 23, you have the specifics of the appeal for them to contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. We're going to come back to this, but obviously I think you'll be able to see that you have an arrangement of chiasm here. That in the general statement, appeal to contend for the faith, A, and then the reason, the admission of the ungodly, B, and then in terms of the address where he goes ahead and develops this, particularizes it, he begins with the admission of the ungodly, B prime, and then ends with the appeal to contend for the faith, A prime. A, B, B prime, A prime. Now, again, uh, the subunits that we have in the address, would be in, which is found in verses 5 through 23, the subunits are found, of course, in verses 5 through 16, the description of the troublers, these ungodly, and then 17 through 23, the exhortations or the appeal to the readers, in verses 17 through 23. Now that's really as far as you would need to go in terms of identifying units and subunits. I uh, actually uh, uh, 
because this is so short, I actually, and, 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 uh, and I was kind of in, interested in what was going on, uh, I, I went a little bit farther in terms of, of identifying even, you, 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 even units within the subunits here. That in verse, like within verses 5 through 16, we have the affirmation, God will judge the ungodly, which is established by past examples in verses 5 through 7. And then in verses 8 through 13, you have qualification. The godly are those who are wreaking havoc among you. They are ungodly and therefore deserve divine judgment. And then he goes back to the affirmation again. God will judge the ungodly established here by prophecy, verses 14 through 16. So this begins and ends with the affirmation that God will judge the ungodly, established by past examples, verses 5 through 7, established by past prophecy, verses 16, verses 14 through 16, and in between these, he really, he, he says, those who have come in your midst are ungodly and deserve divine judgment, are like the ungodly in the past and deserve a judgment uh, similar to the judgment that was declared upon the ungodly in the past, both by past examples and by past prophecy. And then, of course, in verses 17 through 23, uh, he says, you must re- remember this in verse 17, which introduces really two types of exhortations. The exhortation to remember, verses 17 through 19, which le- leads then to the second exhortation, the exhortation to, exhortations to act, to act on the, uh, for, for the sake of themselves, on the one hand, verses 20 and 21, and for the sake of others, verses 22 and verse 23. <clears throat> now, again, with regard to verses 5 through 16, um, uh, what you have emphasized within verses 5 through 16 is a certainty of judgment upon the ungodly. And in both verses 5 through 7 and verses 14 through 16, he appeals to pre-Christian revelation to argue for the certainty of judgment. Two concerns then. God will judge the ungodly, and the ungodly who deserve, ju- who de- deserve divine judgment have gained admission to the church. That's the point he makes, the second point he makes, especially in verses 8 through 13. Now, what you have in verses 17 through 23, though, is a movement toward apostolic revelation, whereas the focus in verses 5 through 16 is on pre-Christian revelation using stories from the Old Testament and uh, actually, uh, well, particularly from uh, the Old uh, uh, Testament and prophecy from the Old uh, Testament uh, prim- primarily, certainly pre-Christian revelation, what he does in verses 17 through 23 is to, is to appeal to apostolic re- revelation there. So he says in verse 17, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. And then he goes ahead and says, it is these who set up divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. As they say, that's exhortations to act for themselves and then to act on on for the sake of others. And verses 22 and 23, and convince some who doubt. Save some by snatching them out of the fire. On some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So here then are the main units and subunits drawn on a chart according to scale. So again, you get the sense here that he gives more space, more critical mass, and two, uh, um, the description of the troublers, then to the exhortations to the readers here. Although, as we'll see, it may very well be in terms of structural relationships that, that, the, that, that, that the book comes to a climax in the exhortation to the readers here. So although he gives more space to the description of the ungodly, 
and the judgment of the ungodly who have come in, uh, is all of this is actually moving toward a may be moving toward a high point of exhortation to the readers here. This, by the way, reminds us that it's not we do it's not necessarily the case that the writer considers as most important that which he spends the most time with. Uh, there may be other reasons why he gives more space, more critical attention, that's to say, attention in terms of critical mass, uh, to one subject over against another. We cannot necessarily draw from that the conclusion in every case that that means that that is the most or the more important uh, thing for him. There may be other reasons for it. Now, in terms of structural relationships, major structural relationships, uh, of course, verses 1 and 2, being a uh, salutation, uh, provide a preparation or realization. This is background according to which we are to understand the rest of the book of Jude. Jude. And it involves background in terms of three elements. First, background in terms of the writer. His identity is Jude. And he describes himself in terms of relationships. He says he's a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. Then in terms of the recipients, they are described in three ways. He says they are called. To those who are called, they are described as beloved, beloved in God the Father, and they are described as kept for Jesus Christ. And then in terms of the salutation proper, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Again, we want to raise questions with regard to this in terms of uh, what, how, how does each main component of this passage, what he says specifically with regard to writer, recipients, and salvation, prepare for and illumine, verses 3 through 24, the rest of the book. Why has Jude introduced this book in precisely the way that he has? And what are the implications, the theological implications, of the answers to the definitive and the rational question? Then, we know too, as we mentioned, I, I've already suggested here, that verses 3 and 4 may contain a general statement that is to say, the nub of the book encapsulate really the, the, the message of the book, general statement, that he goes ahead and um, particularizes in the rest of the book. Now, you have really, within the general statement itself, a substantiation. He says, I am writing to you to appeal to, to contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, because admission has been secretly gained by some who long ago were designated for this condemnation, pardon me, ungodly persons who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So you actually have within the general statement a substantiation. The reason why I say that you ought to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints is because admission has been secretly gained by ungodly persons who were designated for this condemnation. And it's precisely that general statement and the particularization of that general statement that is particularized, is developed, is unpacked in uh, verses uh, 5 through 16, and that chiastically. So he begins by the description of these ungodly persons. He begins by particularizing uh, both the ungodly persons, their ungodliness, and their condemnation. By the way, it's in, in, the gen, in the general statement, notice he says, um, who were designated, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. So, once again, that also is general. He says that they were designated long ago, and of course this is particularized when he talks about the models or the examples um, uh, uh, who, are pre who are presented long ago in the he Hebrew scriptures and the prophecies uh, that were presented previously with regard to judgment upon the ungodly. So it's quite clear that he particularizes, unpacks, specifies this general description of the ungodly persons and their 
condemnation that was designated long ago, here in verses 5 through 16, and then in verses 17 through 21, he particularizes specifically what he means by contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. If you're going to preach or teach on, on, on this passage, which is, of course, perhaps one of the most familiar verses uh, in the book of Jude, uh, to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints would be very important to interpret this in light of the, per- the particularization, the way in which he expands upon this business of contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints in verses 17 through 21. That provides specific content, what's involved in contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And then, of course, we go ahead and raise questions with regard to this. What is the meaning of the major elements in verses 3 and 4? And how is each of them spelled out or developed in the remainder of the book? More specifically, how does the reference to appealing to contend for the faith, etc., illumine the exhortations to the readers in verses 17 through 23? I mean, after all, what he will go ahead and say in verses 17 through 23 uh, involves really what he said back here as contending for the faith. How does an understanding that this involves contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints illumine the meaning of verses 17 through 23? And how does the reason given for this appeal in verse 4, let's just say, because of the uh, introduction of these ungodly persons, illumine the remainder of the book, especially the description of the troublers in verses 5 through 16? What is the meaning of the differences between the faith once for all delivered to the saints on the one hand and the ungodliness of those designated for this condemnation. Exactly what are the differences? What is the meaning of these differences? What is the significance of the difference, dif- differences between the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints and the ungodliness uh, here? Uh, by the way, let me just mention, we don't answer these questions at this point, but, it's, but one thing that, when, once you get to interpretation and begin to answer this question, begin to see that, the, that this whole business of the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints might not be a matter so much of orthodoxy as orthopraxy. Because what he does is to contrast the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints not with false doctrine, but with, but with false living, with an ungodly lifestyle. Again, How are these differences developed in the remainder of the book? Here we're picking up on the particularization. And how do they inform the message of the book as a whole? How does the chiasm support and illumine relationships between the responsibility of readers and the character of the troublers? Now, I didn't mention this with regard to chiasm, but let me say that that one of the functions of chiasm uh, is that it, 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 it generally suggests, it typically suggests that the most significant thing is A and A prime. So when you have chiasm like A, B, as you have here, B, A, uh, one of the purposes of chiasm is to indicate that the A and the A prime is really the most significant thing. And that B and B prime tend to be relatively secondary. If that's, if that's the case, then this business of contending for the faith and the exhortations and really the specifics of this contending for the faith, the exhortations that we have at the end of the book is really the primary concern. He's re- and of course, this is exactly what you'd expect. He is not writing this book to the, to the ungodly. He's writing them to to the godly. So he is actually exhorting the readers to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And that's the most important thing, which is is suggested by the fact that that in the chiasm, he begins with this and he ends with that. Then the rational questions. Why did the writer begin the book with this description of appeal and reason for appeal? Why did he discuss it in this way? Why did he use these terms? And why did he develop these two elements, both the appeal 
And the reason for the appeal, that is to say, the ungodly and their judgment, as he did throughout the rest of the book. Why did he choose to deal with the difference between the faith delivered to the saints and the ungodliness of those designated for condemnation as he did? Why did he thus support and illumine the relationship between the responsibilities of the readers and the character of the troublers by this chiasm? And then what are the implications, the full theological implications of the answers to all of these questions? Now, beyond that, we note here that we may have a kind of causation with contrast in the body of the book. And I, here I'm referring especially to verses 5 through 23. You notice that you have the movement here from the indicative to the imperative. From what is to what therefore you ought to do. Because, in other words, of the troublers, because of their character, completely evil, and by the way, also the kind of evil that seeks to draw you in, to it, into its or orbit. It's not a matter of they're doing their own evil things out there. No, they do it in the midst of you. And this evil is con- is is contaminating, that's part of the character of evil, of their evil, as he describes it in verses 5 through 16, because of this character being completely and contaminatory, contam- contaminatorily, that's a word, evil, and because of the consequence that comes upon that kind of evil, because both of the character of their evil and the consequence of that evil, the judgmental consequence of that evil, therefore... This is how you should respond to it, with the imperative, the indicative of the imperative, hortatory causation. Consequent exhortations to the readers to be righteous and help others to be righteous, to be entirely different from them. Because of this, therefore, be and become entirely different from them. Hence, you have both causation and contrast. And again, we raise questions with regard to this. How are, beginning with the definitive, the what is the meaning of sort of question, how are these troublers described? Exactly how are they described here? And what is the precise meaning of this description? What are the major elements involved in this movement from their evil to the judgment of God, which they can expect? And what is the meaning of each of these major elements? How does a description of these troublers lead to, cause, or produce these exhortations? What are the major differences between the description of these troublers, on the one hand, and the kind of life the writer exhorts his readers to pursue on the other? And what is the precise and specific meaning of these differences? You notice we're picking up here on both the uh, uh, causation and the contrast. And then the the rational questions, why, according to this epistle, were these troublers so completely evil? By the way, this points to one type of rational question. Uh, There are basically two types of rational questions. One type of rational question gets at the reason or the purpose for the writer writing something. Why did Jude want to communicate this? Why did he write this? Why did he emphasize this? But you can also have a rational question directed toward the logic of what is written. He describes these persons as evil. And so, uh, and so uh, it raises a question, why, according to this epistle, were these troublers so completely evil? Why were they this way? According to the logic of the, of, the, of the letter. Why, according to this epistle, did God choose to bring this kind of judgment upon them? He had this causation between their sin, their ungodliness, and God's judgment. Okay, why did God choose to bring this kind of judgment upon them? Why did the writer, now here you get into rational questions that have to do with the purpose of the writer, 
Why did the writer thus describe these troublers and why did he wish to present and emphasize this causal connection between sin and judgment in the way that he has? Why did the writer support his exhortations to the readers by this contrasting description of the troublers? And then what are the full theological implications of the answers to these definitive and rational questions? Now, again, we don't answer these questions necessarily at this point, although Jude is sufficiently short that you could move directly into interpretation phase, but at this stage, we're simply making observations and raising questions that then will serve as a bridge to interpretation. <clears throat> now, we mentioned that the con- we have a conclusion here, an epistolary conclusion in verse 24, that is really presented as a doxology. <clears throat> Just remind us of what we have here. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. What we have, notice, in verses 5 through 23, is a description of the dangers or threats to the Christian life and the exhortations to righteous living, which may then be actually substantiated by verses 24 through 25. Verses 24 and 25 may be the, may be the reason for uh, what he says in verses 5 through 23. In verses 24 and 25, we have the assurance of the divine power to preserve believers. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing. Assurance of the divine power to preserve believers righteous throughout life, even to the judgment seat of God, and doxological praise to God because of God's glorious saving power. In other words, uh, what you have here is the, the saving and preserving power of God in Christ is actually the means for the possibility of fulfilling the exhortations regarding righteous living. He has urged them to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. He has urged them to remember the predictions of the apostles. He has urged them to build themselves up in their most holy faith, to pray in the Holy Spirit, to keep themselves in the love of God, to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life, to convince some who doubt, to save some by snatching them out of the fire, to have mercy on some with fear, to hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. And here, verses 25 through, and 24 and 25 indicate that, that they are able to do this because of the saving and preserving power of God and Christ. They're able to do it because of this, and they are, that's a substantiation. They are able to do it by means of this. That is to say, it's a saving and preserving power of God and Christ, which is the means for uh, the end of their fulfilling the exhortations regarding righteous living, both in verse 3 and verse, verses 24 and 25. Now, this is theologically quite significant because it suggests, really, that on the basis of their own human power, they are actually not at all up to the task, not at all able uh, to respond in anything like an appropriate and helpful way to these ungodly persons who have found their way into their midst to fulfill the exhortations that Jude gives to them. They cannot do it. But God and his Christ are more than capable of equipping these readers to fulfill the exhortations and completely to overcome the dangers that are being posed by these ungodly persons in their midst. Now, again, we want to raise questions with regard to this, definitive questions. How specifically and precisely do verses 24 through 25 provide support or reasons for both the description of of dangers to the Christian life, including judgment upon the ungodly in the church, and the exhortations to righteous living? By the way, verses 24 and 25 substantiate also the judgment upon ungodly here in this letter, 
because he is suggesting here that the ungodly do not have to be ungodly. That is to say, their ungodliness is really an affront to grace, to a, an affront to the a, a rejection of and a denial of the divine power that is available also to them to live different lives, to live lives above ungodliness. So that the divine power, the divine resources, is actually a basis for judgment upon sin. So again, how do verses 24 and 25, and especially the doxological affirmation of God's glorious power in salvation, bring the book to a climax and illumine the book as a whole? Why did the rational questions, why did the writer thus support or ground his descriptions and exhortations in verses 5 through 23 with this assurance of divine power to preserve believers and this doxology of praise to God because of his glorious saving and preserving power? Even though that's the case, even though it's true, he didn't have to say it. Why was it important for him actually to say it and to say it in this way? Why did he thus emphasize this divine power as the means of fulfilling the exhortation in the book? And again, what are the implications to this? Now, we also have here, of course, in the book, a recurrence of contrast. And note that in most books you have anywhere from three to six or seven, maybe, major structure relationships. And that's what we're finding here. But you'll notice that you have... um, a recurrence of biographical contrast between the readers and the troublers. The readers are described as holy, verses 3 and 20, whereas the troublers here are described as ungodly, verses 4, 15, and 18. The readers experience or await mercy, verses 2, 21, 23, whereas the troublers experience or await judgment, verses 4 through 16. The readers are described as unblemished, Verse 24, whereas the troublers are, de- are described as defiled and stained. Verses 8, 12, and 23. The readers are described as or expected to pray in the Spirit. Verse 20, the troublers are described as being devoid of the Spirit. Verse 19, the readers stand before God. Verse, will stand before God. Verse 24, The troublers stumble or fall away. Verse 6, the readers are saved. That's his language, verses 3 and 25. The troublers are destroyed, also his language, verses 5, 7, 10, 11, 13, and 15. And here I would note, with regard to this uh, contrast, repeated contrast between the readers and the troublers, the role of the introduction and conclusion. Notice that the introduction is, a very, is very positive toward the readers. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And the conclusion is also very positive toward the readers. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing etc., whereas in verses 23 through 23, you have the negative description of the opponents. I would also note the role of the word kept, the same word in Greek is used throughout tereo, the word kept uh, here. Notice how you have a recurrence of the word kept, uh, used one, two, three, four, five, six times, twice in one verse, verse six, but throughout the book, the role kept Notice that the readers are said to be kept by God for salvation and to keep themselves. Whereas the troublers are kept by God for condemnation and have not kept themselves. So kept is used really in such a way as to emphasize the difference The readers are kept for one thing, or keep themselves for one thing. The ungodly are kept for another thing, and do not keep themselves. So the word keep is very, very important here. And again, we raise questions, definitive, rational, and implicational questions regarding this. What is the specific meaning of each of these major differences, and of others that may yet be identified, between the readers and the troublers? 
Or perhaps we ought to say the ungodly, because that's the word that he uses to describe them. How are these major differences related to each other? And how do they illumine one another? How does the role of the introduction and con- the introduction conclusion in relation to the body and the kept theme contribute to and illumine the differences between the readers and the troublers? So they're all definitive questions. And the rational questions, why, according to the logic of the book of Jude, did these differences between the readers and the troublers exist? Why did you describe and develop these differences as he did? And what are the full theological implications of the answers to the definitive and the rational questions? And then we also, though, have a recurrence of comparison. Um, The past description of evil, of the evil or the troublers, is repeatedly described compared to the present phenomena of the troublers. And this is indicated by the repeated use of these or these are. So notice you have the past description in verses 5 through 7. Now I desire to remind you, though you were once for all uh, fully informed, that he who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels that did not keep their own position but left their proper dwelling have been kept by him in eternal chains, in the nether gloom until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise acted immorally and indulged in in unnatural lust, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire, yet in like manner these men, these are the current people in your midst, in like manner these men in their dreamings defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile the glorious ones. So he moves from past description to present phenomena by way of comparison, in like manner. Notice he does the same thing in verses 9 and 10. Begins with past description. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, present phenomena. But... These men, or these are the ones, who revile whatever they do not understand, and by those things that they know by instinct, as irrational animals do, they are destroyed. Again, verse 11. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain, and abandon themselves to the sake of gain to, for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perish in Korah's rebellion. That's past description. Now, Comparison with present phenomenon. These are, these are the ones who are blemishes on your love feast, as they boldly carouse together, looking after themselves, waterless clouds carried along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. And he does the same thing in verse 14. It was of these also that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with his holy myriads to execute judgment on all, and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness which they committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. See, that's the past. Now, present phenomenon, by way of comparison, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own passions, loudmouth boasters, flattering people to gain advantage, and he does it finally in verses 17 and 18. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their ungodly passions. Now verse 19, that's past description, now present phenomena. It is these who set up divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit, etc. So past description of evil troubles is compared then repeatedly to the present phenomena of these ungodly in their midst. And again, we raise questions with regard to uh, this. What are the specific points of similarity between the past descriptions and the present phenomena? And what is the meaning of each of these points of similarity? How do these points of similarity illumine the character of these ungodly ones? These, uh, that is to say, are presently in your midst. How are these individual points of similarity related uh, to one another, and how do they illumine one another? Rational questions. Why were these ungodly so similar in these ways to the past descriptions? 
Why did you thus present and emphasize these similarities? And what are the implications? And then, of course, we identify key versus or strategic areas that represent, uh, key with, uh, that represent major relationships that we identified. Verses 3 and 4, of course, represent particularization with substantiation and contrast, as we saw. And verses 5, 17 through 20, and 23 represent causation and contrast with recurrence of causation and substantiation and represent recurrence of contrast and the recurrence of comparison. Verses 24 and 25 would represent the substantiation with instrumentation, and verses 1 and 2 represents preparation, realization. So out of the epistle, we notice that these are the most significant, the key verses. And then higher critical data, just on the basis of the book itself. The writer identifies himself as Jude, the brother of James. He was thoroughly acquainted with the Old Testament and the apocryphal and pseudepigraphical writings, apparently. May therefore have been Jewish and especially acquainted with Jewish apocalypticism. The recipients were believers, makes that clear, largely pursuing the righteousness of God. He describes them as being called, being beloved. Uh, he, he describes God as being our God, our Master Jesus Christ. He talks of our common salvation and about God's power to keep you from falling. But they were bothered, oppressed by ungodly in the church. They had had prior contact with the reader, with the writer, obviously, according to verses 3 and 5. And had become converted or nurtured under apostolic witness. Remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they said to you, he says. Uh, the occasion was, a, was personal desire to write about common salvation, but also, of course, the presence of these ungodly in the church, how, and we notice how he describes them uh, here. Uh, also, the date of writing may have been sometime after the age of the apostles. Uh, verse uh, 17, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, at least sometime after the ministry of the apostles, at least some of them, to the readers of the church, the readers of the epistle. With regard to other major impressions, the tone of the book is one of condemnation, especially in the description of the ungodly, but also a tone of hope and encouragement, especially toward the readers. We note that the writer twice, twice alludes to extra-canonical material, presumably or apparently from the Assumption of Moses uh, and from First Enoch. Uh, we note that the general statement of verses 3 and 4 begins with the phrase, being very eager to write to you of our common salvation, uh, this phrase may be significant to the book, but its meaning is actually unclear. It may mean, although being very eager to write to you of our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you about something else, thus indicating a contrast with what he had, had actually, a contrast between what he actually has written and what he had originally intended to write. That is to say, what he has written is not about our common salvation, but about something else namely an appeal to contend for the faith. But it may mean, because I was very eager to write to you of our common salvation, I wrote to you, I've written to you appealing to uh, contend to the faith, which would be not so much a matter of contrast, but a matter of causation. Because I found it, ne because I, I found it necessary to write to you appealing to, the, to contend, because I, wanted to, I was eager to write to you of our common salvation, therefore I found it necessary to write to you appealing to to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, which would suggest that what he actually writes to them is about our common salvation. Well, anyway, uh, that, that essentially is, uh, is a book, is a survey of the book of Jude uh, here uh, that uh, we have. Hope that that helps in terms of illustrating some of the principles that we talked about in terms of book survey. This is Dr. David Bauer in his teaching on inductive Bible study. This is session number eight, book survey, Jude.